And now, without further ado, I present to you the Honorable John R. Lewis. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for the Presidential Medal. I'm honored. I'm delighted. Very pleased to be here. You're a good looking group. I know you're smart, gifted, and ready to stand up and speak up and find a way to get in the way. It's good to be here at St. Joseph University. Good to see two honorable mayors of the great city of Philadelphia. Thank you, and thank you for your work. It's not an easy job to be a the mayor to be an elected official these days. But thank you for your service. Thank you for keeping the faith. And I, I'm honored to, to be here. If it hadn't been for Martin Luther King Jr., I don't know what would have happened to me. Mr. President, I want to thank you for those kind words of introduction. Father, thank you for your service. Thank you for bearing witness to the truth. Thank you, my dear young sister. You're so smart, you're so gifted. The world will hear from you. Now, I didn't grow up in a big city like Philadelphia. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, how many of you students remember when you were four? Now, what happened to us? With the $300 that my father had saved, a man sold him 110 acres of land. 110 acres of land for $300. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and coin, lots of peanuts. Don't tell the people in Georgia that I don't eat too many peanuts today. I ate so many peanuts when I was growing up, I just don't want to see no more peanuts. <laughs> Sometime I would get on a flight flying from Atlanta to Washington, or Washington back to Atlanta, and a flight attendant tried to offer me some peanuts. I said, no thank you, I don't care for any peanuts. <laughs> growing up on a farm, we not only raised peanuts, we raised cotton and corn. Hogs, cows, and chickens. On the farm, it was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens. I became very good at raising chickens. I want to know any of you young, gifted, smart students know anything about raising chickens? But some of you like to eat chicken, right? But you don't know anything about raising chicken. But let me tell you what I had to do as a young boy growing up. When the setting hen was set to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a, in a pencil, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, now John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest. And there'll be some more fresh eggs. They would tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting here. You follow me? You don't follow me, it's okay. 
So when the little check will hatch, I will fool these selling hens. I will cheat on these selling hens. I will take these little chicks and give them to another hen. Get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three more weeks for the little chicks to hatch. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hens. It was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do or the most nonviolent thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher from the Sizzle Roebuck store. Now, most of you are not old enough to remember the Sizzle Roebuck catalog, are you? Maybe your grandparents or great grandparents. Maybe your uncles and aunts. It's a big book. People call it an ordering book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. So I just kept on cheating on these setting hands. But as a little boy growing up, Father, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So one of my uncles had Santa Claus to bring me a Bible. I learned to read the Bible. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and first cousins would lie on the outside of the chicken yard. And I would start speaking or preaching to these chickens. And some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. <laughs> well, that's enough for them. But growing up there in rural Alabama, when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. When I asked my great grandparents, my grandparents, my mother and my father, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard of Rosa Parks. I heard of Martin Luther King Jr. Heard him on all radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way inspired me to get in trouble, what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. And I've been getting in trouble ever since. And today, all across America, young people, students, religious leaders, women, are getting in trouble. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to stand up, to say something, to do something, and not be quiet. So students, young people, in 1957, when I was 17 years old, I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my sisters or brothers, didn't tell any of my teachers. I wanted to attend a little college 10 miles from my home. Then it was called Troy State College, now it's known as Troy University. It's all white. Submitted my application, my high school transcript. So I sent this letter off to Dr. King. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. 
In the meantime, I've been accepted at the Look College American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. Uncle mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. I bought a Greyhound bus, put everything that I own, except a little chicken in a footlocker that my uncle gave me. And I boarded a bus to Nashville, Tennessee to study. After being in Nashville, Tennessee for about three weeks, I told one of my teachers that I had been in contact with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This teacher knew Dr. King. They had studied together at Morehouse College in Atlanta. So he informed Dr. King that it was there. Martin Luther King, Jr. got back in church and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. So in March of 1958, I boarded a bus, traveled from Troy to Montgomery. And a young lawyer who also was a minister by the name of Fred Gray, who was the lawyer for Rosa Parks, but Dr. King in the Montgomery movement, became our lawyer during the Freedom Rides and during the march from Selma to Montgomery. Met me at the Greyhound bus station in downtown Montgomery. Drove me to the First Baptist Church, pastor by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, and ushered me in the pastor's study. And I walked in. I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy standing behind the desk. I was so scared. I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King said, Are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. And you still call me the boy from Troy. So a lot of my friends and a lot of my colleagues know the story, and they call me the boy from Troy. And I've been in the Congress nine thirty years, but I'm just a boy from Troy that was inspired by the teaching of Jesus, inspired by the teaching of Gandhi, by the teaching and the action of Martin Luther King, Jr. And I got involved in the sit-ins. We'd sit in there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served, and someone would come up and spit on us. We put a lighted cigarette out in our hair, or down our backs, pour hot water, hot coffee, or hot chocolate on us. Beat us. And we were told over and over again, if we continue to sit in, we would get arrested, we would be arrested, we would be taken to jail. And I thought about it, and I said, if I were going to be arrested and go to jail, I wanted to look clean. I wanted to look fresh, as many of the men students would say during those days. I had very little money as a student. So I went to a used men's store in downtown Nashville, Tennessee, and bought a suit. I paid $5 for the suit. A vest came with it. And when I was first arrested the first time, on February 27, 1960, I did look clean. I did look fresh. I did look sharp. And I tell you, my first arrest, I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like I crossed over. So during the 60s, I was arrested 40 times. And since I've been in Congress, another five times. And I'm probably going to get arrested again for something. My last arrest, a group of us, members of Congress and 200 private citizens, on the Capitol ground, protested, trying to get the former Speaker of the House to bring forth a comprehensive immigration reform bill. We have hundreds and thousands of dreamers. It's not fair. 
It's not right for so many of these young people and people not so young to live in fear. We need to set them on a path to citizenship. That's the right thing to do. When the Pope came and spoke to a joint session of the Congress, he said, we all are immigrants. We all come from some other place. He spoke about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He spoke about the march from Selma to Montgomery. When A. Philip Randolph and others were planning the march on Washington in 1963, Mr. Randolph said over and over again, we all come from some other place. Our foremothers and our forefathers maybe came here in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Dr. King put it another way, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, if not, we were perished as fools. So it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We're one people. We're one family. We all live in the same house, not just the American house, but the world house. When for Martin Luther King Jr., I don't know what would have happened to our country, to America. This man taught us to stand up, to speak up, and to speak out. So the signs that I saw when I was growing up, those signs are gone. The signs that said white waiting and colored waiting, white men and colored men, White women, colored women. The only places we will see those signs today would be in a book, in a museum, on a video. So when you tell me nothing has changed, I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes because Martin Luther King Jr. passed this way. He gave us courage to stand up to be brave, to be courageous, to be bold. He helped liberate America. Our country is better. As a people, we are better. But we still have a distance to go. There are individuals trying to take us back. We've come too far. We made too much progress, and we're not going back, we're going forward to redeem the soul of America and create a beloved community. So I said to you as students, as young people, as parents, as teachers, scholars, as political leaders, Never give up, never give in, never lose faith. We will get there. We will create a beloved community. I'm not worried. Don't be worried. Don't be weary. Just think a few short years ago, in the heart of the Deep South, during those days of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, people could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. In my native state of Alabama, in parts of Georgia, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, state of Mississippi, black men and women were asked to count the number of bubbles on a bar of soap the number of jelly beans in a jar. People stood in unmovable lines. We changed that. I would never, ever forget a 
Now, during the spring of 1965, when I had all of my hair, a few years younger, that a group of us set out on the march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize to the nation and to the world that people could not participate in the democratic process. We had attended church that Sunday morning. We left the church. We came out. We lined up in twos. We knelt. The Reverend Andrew Young stood, raised his hand up while we were kneeling, led a prayer. We got up in an orderly, peaceful fashion and started walking toward the Edmund Pettus Bridge from Selma toward Montgomery. I was leading that march with young man Jose Williams from Dr. King's organization. As we were crossing the bridge, down below we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. We continued to walk. And I said to Jose Williams, Jose, can you swim? He said, yes, a little. He said, John, can you swim? I said, no. I said, that's too much water down there. We cannot jump. If something happens, we must go forward. He continued to walk in an orderly, peaceful, non-violent fashion. We got to the edge of the bridge. A member of Alabama State Troopers said, this is an unlawful march. It will not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your homes or to your church. And Jose Williams said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. The Major said, Troopers advance. I said, Major, may I have a word? He said, there would be no word. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks and bull whips, shrimping us with horses, releasing the tear gas. I was the first one to be hit, knocked down. My legs went from under me. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die on that bridge, but somehow, God Almighty kept me. 53 years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge, but apparently a group took me back to the little church. And I remember being back at the church, and someone asked me to say something. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam. And can I send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to vote? The next thing, a new father. I've been admitted to the Good Samaritan Hospital. And it was a group of sisters, the sisters of St. Joseph, that took care of us. Hadn't been for these sisters, I don't know what would have happened to the 17 of us that have been hurt. But Dr. King came to see me that morning, the next morning, and said, John, don't worry. I have made an appeal for religious leaders to come to Selma. And more than a thousand ministers, priests, rabbis, and nuns came and walked across that bridge. That Tuesday following what happened on that Sunday. And two weeks later, we made it all the way from Selma to Montgomery. 
and more than 35,000 people walk with us. The power of the way of peace, the way of love, the power of the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence got us over with the blessing of God Almighty. Martin Luther King Jr., this man, this one man has changed America forever. And people all over the world today understand what Dr. King was all about. The evening that we heard that he had been assassinated on April 4th, 1968, I was in Indianapolis, Indiana, campaigning with Robert Kennedy. And when I heard that uh, Dr. King had been assassinated, I said to myself, we still have Bobby. And two months later, Robert Kennedy was gone. If these two men had lived, our nation and our world would be better. But all of us, each one of us, have an obligation, a mission, and a mandate to pick up where Dr. King and Robert Kennedy left off. We can do it, and we must do it. So hang in there. We have miles to travel. We have to save our country, save our democracy. I wish each and every one of you well. May God bless you, and may God keep you. Thank you very much.